So, um, we're looking at uh, Hebrews, um, the whole book, Sermon of Hebrews. And um, we're going to look at it. This will probably be the last time we look at it, this side of 2019. No, this side of 2019. I don't know what I mean. In my head, it won't make sense. If you was going to say next Monday, which Monday do you mean? I mean not this Monday coming, I mean the next Monday, the Monday after. But some people think I mean tomorrow. No. So you all got wrong. I'm right. Thank you. So, but uh, yeah, we're going to, reason being, you'll be pleased to know, I'm not speaking for another four weeks. Hooray. Oh. So, uh, no, I thought it would be hooray. It would be, oh. So, let's just look at this Hebrews chapter 8. For a very quick recap, this is probably more likely a sermon. This wasn't a letter per se. This was more of a sermon. Um, long argument over whether it could have been written. It was a sermon that was done by a man or by a woman. It wasn't done by the Apostle Paul. We already know that now. So, um, there you go. So it was written or sermonized or preached to a church made of mainly Jewish people who accepted Jesus as the Messiah. They were under great persecution. They had their family and friends trying to get them to come back to being Jewish. You know, give up this whole Jesus malarkey being the Messiah. You're suffering because of it. We had all of that. And we recognized that there was probably great temptation in returning back because when you're finding walking for Jesus hard, it's so easy to want to go back to one's old way of life. Yes? So, this is probably going on. So this is combating. So the preacher here uh, wants to point out that Jesus is better than anything else. So he explains that he's better than angels, because there's something to do with angels. He talks about the great salvation that is offered through Jesus, that was proven by signs and wonders, <coughs> and by various mis miracles. I'm running through this really quickly, because I've done this enough times. And that Jesus is in control of our ultimate destiny. Amen. Amen. Any Pentecostals in the house? <laughs> to the Jewish converts, Jesus is greater than Moses. Because Moses was a servant in the house of God, and Jesus is the owner. So therefore then. And then the last sort of thing he wants to talk about is the fact that we can enter the throne room of God with boldness. Do we remember that? Yes. Cat flats and chips. By the way, my cats are now, my new kittens are now bringing in worms into the house. <laughs> it's a big, fat, juicy one there this morning. So, anyway, moving on. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, go to the website. It's all on there about cat flats and chips. Chips, not the ones you eat, but the ones that go in the back of cat's nets. So, and then we did the whole thing on Melchizedek. And who understood it? Notice I didn't put my hands in the air, but that's good. Jesus is the priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So let's dive in. Hebrews chapter 8. Verses 1 to 6. Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honour beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There he ministers in the heavenly ta tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord and not by human hands. And since every high priest is required to offer gifts and sacrifices, our high priest must make an offering to. If he were here on earth, he would not have been a priest, since there already are priests who offer the gifts required by the law. They serve in a system of worship that is only a copy, a shadow of the real one in heaven. For when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, God gave him this warning. Be sure that you make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. But now Jesus, our high priest, has give, been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. I'm not going to go into all of this because we've 
the, the, the Hebrew preacher has spent enough time trying to point out that Jesus is better than any of the old priesthood in the Jewish uh, way of doing things than anything else. He's tried to already, we've spent enough time on this, looking at the fact that Jesus is it. He is the high priest, yes? And so this is what he's getting at here. He's just saying, look, the main point is, is that we have a high priest is at the place of honour with God. So why do you want to go back to the old system? Why do you want to go back to the old way? Why bother? <coughs> we have a priest who is interceding for us a better covenant. So that means he's looking at two covenants, isn't he? The old covenant and the new covenant. Or the Old Testament and the New Testament. By the way, it's the same term, by the way, just in case you didn't know. So that's what he's trying to do. Why bother? Jesus is better. Stop looking back at your old way of life of worshipping God. So then he carries on in verse 7. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would not have been a need for a second covenant to replace it. First covenant was faulty. That's a bit worrying, isn't it? I thought about that and thought, hang on a minute, I'm going to struggle with this. That the Lord made a faulty covenant. I don't know about you, get your head around this for a minute. That God, who we say is perfect, made a faulty covenant covenant. He did a dodgy deal with the people of Israel. <coughs> I don't know you, but that's a bit worrying, isn't it? Yeah. Went going buy a used car. <laughs> and God held out his dodgy hand and went, there you go, done. That's what that could sound like. But that's not what he's saying. Saying that the first covenant was faulty in the respect of that it really only dealt with, eventually, the outward appearance. <coughs> it turned into, by the people of God, into stuff that we look like on the outside, rather than dealing with stuff on the inside. It never fulfilled the internal change, believe that God wanted to happen, for the people as an individual and also for them as a community of God's people. And here's an interesting bit. In Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, unfortunately the NLT doesn't rendition this very well, but <coughs> it says here, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is your God, sorry, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your strength. You must and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today repeat them again and again to your children talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road when you're going to bed and when you're getting up tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders write them on the doorposts of your home and on your gates done that recently When's the last time anybody wrote the Lord's commands on the, on the front of your door? No? When's the last time you woke up every day <laughs> reciting the Lord's commands to everybody in your household? I did it this morning to the cats. No, I didn't. In there, in that covenant, in, in other translations that render it slightly better, it says actually... You should commit these laws to your heart. You <coughs> must do this. Do you understand the difference? It rests on you to spend all that time memorising, going through, committing them in here. You spend the time doing it. Yeah, you with us so far? Are we all good at doing that? Come on, who wakes up every day and goes, right, I'm going to read my Bible. And I'm going to read the next three chapters. And you do it with great enthusiasm. And you've committed it to memory for the day. <coughs> See? No? Interesting. 
Where it was faulty was it relied upon us a lot more. Because don't forget, this was written to a community of people. So the idea, the whole community of people was to inspire each other. And the king was meant to be almost the example of what it like was to follow God. Yes? So, any leader does a bang-up job of being a brilliant example of what it like to follow God, yes? I mean, I'm an amazing example, yes? Don't say yes, I was joking. <laughs> king David was a brilliant example, wasn't he? Solomon, he was a brilliant example, wasn't he? How many wives and concubines did he have? Not about you lot, men, but like, really? <laughs> Sorry? Only a thousand. Yeah, I know, it's a small number, isn't it? I'm just thinking about all that time they all want to go shopping on a Saturday. How expensive it is. <laughs> It relies upon us. This is where I think I want God, God today wants us to focus. Verse 8. But when God found fault with the people. So when God found fault with the people. He said. Now here's the thing. Who's good at fault finding? <laughs> Who's good at fault finding in others? Come on. Who's really good at fault finding in their new husbands? Oh, sorry. <laughs> By the way, not bad, eh? Got married last Sunday in church this Sunday. How many honeymooners would do that, yeah? <laughs> Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Christmas. Christmas really is their surname. <laughs> Who's really good at finding fault in themselves? Oh, come on, hey, folks. Hey, hey. Right. So I, don't worry about it, everybody else's hands are up. And even those hands that aren't up, they're lying to themselves. <laughs> Who's really good at finding fault in yourself? Yeah, really good at it, yeah? And you're really good at finding fault in others as well, yeah? We're all very, very good at it. God is also really good at finding fault in us. He sees all your flaws and faults. He sees all mine. Yeah? Isn't that, oh, God sees all my faults. How does it make you feel right now? I'm not asking you to answer today, because we can try and make this quick. So God sees all your faults. Don't know about you lot, but that makes me go, Ugh. trust me, you don't have to, I know them already. And he also knows the faults that we don't even know about. So normally when that happens, and when we that dawns on us, we tend to feel rather condemned round about. Now, who's feeling a little bit, don't have to commit to it, but you tend to. Yeah, you might not in church right now, you're feeling a bit elated and thinking that's right, Holy Spirit's in, we're doing all right. But you can come to church finding fault with yourself, yeah? And you can drag up your past. Don't panic, God can do that as well. It's amazing. He's brilliant at doing it. He's really good at going, I know. Because he's God and he's all-knowing, so he'll know. But then this is what he says. When God found fault with the people, he said, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. <laughs> by the way, I just want to reflect on that. You ever notice that in the quote from Jeremiah? That actually, by the way, he's quoting now Jeremiah 31. He, God took them by the hand. It's a very parental action, yeah? Mm. Mm. It's a very fatherly, motherly action. Mm. God took them by the hand. So anybody that says the God of the Old Testament was some wrathful, nasty God, I don't know how you get that when you clearly see that he says, I took you by the hand. He didn't go, I grabbed you by your wrist and dragged you out. I took you by the hand and led you. When I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt, they did not remain faithful to my covenant, 
So I turned my back on them, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel on that day, says the Lord. I will put, now note this, I will put my laws in their minds. I, says the Lord, will write them on their hearts. There is a distinct difference between the two covenants. God does the initiation, not us. I will be their God and they will be my people. And they need not teach their neighbours, nor will they need to teach their relatives saying, you should know the Lord. For everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already and I will forgive their wickedness and I will never again remember their sins. For me, the focus is today, when we're going to take communion soon, because this is not going to be a long sermon, because I was up from three o'clock this morning. I'm going to get back to sleep here. <laughs> this is the point I'm going to believe that God wants to point out. Even when he found fault in us, he said, I'm going to make the new covenant. I love you so much, I'm going to make the covenant. I'm going to put my laws in your heart and your mind. In other words, I'm going to deposit the Holy Spirit in you. He's going to write it on you. <coughs> you don't need to do all the work. He's going to do it for you. And the point being that you don't need to go around teaching everybody, which would make my life really easy if I could just sit here and say, Lord, and dump it. But the point being is saying, it's the interaction is going to be more personal. Which it is now in the New Covenant. Our interaction, our relationship with God has a much more personal feel for it. What must have happened in the Old Covenant was it became, because they were going to this temple as such all the time, it, that's only where God was. But now you're the temple. And so it's personal. So you don't need to worry about finding fault in you. God could do that, but as he said... I'm wiping that all away. Because even when there is fault in you, I still come for you. Does it not say in the, um, in the New Testament that for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son? Yeah? So God so found fault with the world, but because he so loved the world, he decided, well, I'm going to come and repair it. Not leave you to wallow and you do it. I'm going to sort it out. Does it also say in Romans 5, 8, um, was it, uh, it was on the tip of my tongue and it's now gone, it's really annoying, that, um, yet while we were still sinners, he died for us. So I don't know how good you are at finding fault within yourself. Why bother? Because God has wiped it away. You acknowledge it, but you don't wallow in it. We remove it away. Amen? Amen. It's God that takes the initiative with us, my brothers and sisters. Not us. He takes the initiative. <coughs> okay. I think some of us still wake up and, how can I put this? I almost think we have to still work towards being right with God. We don't. Because he already knows the faults. But he's still the one who did the work to make us. He done the work to make us right with him. Not the other way around. That's the problem with the old covenant. It was all really about based on works. And it was never going to work. Fireworks here from last night. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole point being, that, that, that was interesting. I was having a conversation with my neighbour last night. And, oh, God, I'm being filmed. I can't say it now. But fireworks were going off. And I said, no, that's me causing that. That's God doing that. <laughs> Same thing. So the whole point being is God who takes the initiative. He sorts out your faults, not the other way around. You may ask a question. So why does folks keep resurfacing? Mm. Good question. Two things. 
if the faults keep resurfacing, because if you're talking about you committing the same sin or the same act, that's because I would suggest that we're not giving it fully to God all the time. Sometimes we are going to repeat stuff, but we can... <laughs> Alright, let's try and ask this. <coughs> A bit better, Warren. Come on, son. Where does your focus lie when the fault comes up? On myself. There's your answer. Because it should be on... God. Correct. <clears throat> Following Jesus is not about us stopping sinning. <clears throat> That is not your backstop position, folks. Your backstop position is waking up and going, OK, I've got to make sure I don't do anything wrong today. You, you, you're already failing at that point. What your backup position should be is, Lord, today's your day. What do you want me to do? And then when you're doing what God wants you to do, it doesn't mean that God sits there downloading information every five <laughs> seconds to you. Normally it just drops, actually I heard a brilliant sermon last Sunday at a wedding by a best man who talked about the fact that you, sometimes you just hear from God and he downloads and you realise that God is talking to you. <laughs> Never know I've been at a wedding, sorry if you weren't at the wedding, but someone was a, um, anyway, long story, won't go into it now. But the whole point being is you, you just allow things to drop into your God will talk to you quietly. It doesn't mean it's an audible voice, sometimes it's an idea, sometimes it's not. But you wake up, if you ask God, well, what do you want me to do today? If you give it to him, you just go along with the day. Now, by the way, if a bad thought pops into your mind, do you know you haven't sinned? It's if you then carry on with the bad thought. Does that make sense? You know? You can let it, let it pop in, but if you go, oh, where's that come from? No, no, I'm not having that. I'm give that to God. You haven't sinned, folks. We all have bad thoughts, do we not? Yeah. I've had at least half a dozen already this morning. <laughs> Point being, doesn't mean it's about temptation. Might someone get tempted? Temptation is not about that you won't be tempted. It's about whether you continue on in that temptation. So if you know you're doing something that God, you know is something that's a continuous sin in your life, and you're continually doing it, yeah, you should be doing it. Why is your focus on you? You should be giving that to God to deal with. Because as you direct your thoughts to the Lord, and direct your thoughts as well to Him, it changes your perspective of what you're doing, doesn't it? It takes you higher than yourself. God is not sitting there ready to mallet you over the head because you've been naughty. Because if He'd done that, He would never have made this covenant that we're about to celebrate, which I'm going to stop in a minute that we're about to celebrate. We are free. <laughs> and we need to unlock our minds. We need to allow God to unlock this and recognise we are free. We don't have to walk around wondering whether I got it wrong today or not. Warren, question for you. Yeah. Why is this someone in your family we've had this discussion. Yeah, so you in the past. We forgive them, but we're still struggling. So they've hurt you in the past. And you're still struggling with that problem. I just want to deal with that. I don't want to nail down too specifically because obviously we'll be here and it is being filmed. Okay. So if we are so let me try and get the gist here quickly. They've upset you. They've said sorry but you're still struggling with what they did to you. Yes. That's you needing to ask God to help you to forgive them and move on. That's the simple solution. It's never a simple answer all the time, but that's the solution. You've got to need to ask God to work in you to find a place of forgiveness. I suppose part of that for me would be recognising the fact that I know I screw up all the time and I get it wrong and I've upset people in the past and I've upset God, but God has forgiven me. So I need to learn to forgive others, and it's you know it's part of the Lord's prayer, isn't it? Help us to forgive those who have sinned against us, as you have forgiven. You know, it's that whole process. <coughs> it doesn't mean that because you're not forgiving someone, God's not forgiving you. It's a process. God understands me. Sometimes I have to go through a process, but we have to genuinely be 
on <clears throat> that process with the Lord working towards wanting to forgive someone. <coughs> Any other question? I'll up for a bit. Of, you want to do some deep theology? No? Point being is that for me, I really want us to focus on the fact that yet, while God found fault with the people, he's the one who said, here is the new covenant in my son Jesus. Here it is. And when we recognise that, that actually God, though finds fault in us, loves us nonetheless and still works, you know, still wants the relationship with us, and he's the one who instigates the relationship, I mean, how many people that you find a fault in do you go up to and want to be loving towards them? No? Strange, that, isn't it? Yeah, God doesn't go, no, I'm not interested. He goes, no, I'm going to show you even more love. So the question has to be for today. How do you think you should live your life in the knowledge of that? That no matter what, God still loves you. And you're in that covenant with him because he instigated it, not you. So we're going to take communion now. Holly, now I'm going to hand back to you. We'll give you a few moments to think why Carly sorts this out. And it's in this time of taking communion, in this time of when Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, do this in this new covenant. Think about what it is that God is trying to tell you. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.